Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Griffith Observatory's local solar noon coverage of the vernal equinox. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and with me is Patrick So. And also joining us is our very own director, Dr. Edwin C. Krupp. And we're very lucky to have him providing a presentation today called Inhabiting the Meridian. Um, but first, uh, this presentation is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and Parks in the city of Los Angeles. And as always, we like to thank our nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation, that helps us with so much of what we do. But first of all, today, we are here to talk about local solar noon and the vernal equinox. Patrick, what is all this about? Well, uh, if we can go to the slide here. Uh, today is the first day of spring, and it's the first day of spring, or the spring equinox, or the vernal equinox, uh, the proper name for it. And it's uh, springtime, first day of spring in the northern hemisphere. But at the same time, in the southern hemisphere, um, autumn begins. So it's the first day of autumn simultaneously in the southern hemisphere. And that occurred at 8.33 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time when the sun was positioned exactly in, at the equator. Now, um, the Earth has reached a point in its orbit where the uh, Earth's north-south axis is vertically orientated so that when sunlight falls on it, and as the Earth rotates, uh, day and night is equal around the world. Wow, well, very interesting. So we are already in springtime here in the Northern Hemisphere and folks in the Southern Hemisphere, your autumn has begun. So get ready for those colder temperatures as we continue to warm up here up in the North. Now, something else is going on also. We started this broadcast at noon, but we have something called local solar noon happening. And if you take a look here, you can see the sun rises in the East and it'll reach some point where it is highest in the sky. And that's actually what we call high noon or local solar noon. There, it just passed it. And then the sun's going to continue and go and set off in the west over there. But you've probably heard the term high noon before. Um, this Gary Cooper movie, of course, used it. Um, and they were talking about the time you could tell with the sun. Not everybody had a clock. Not everybody had access to a, a nice watch. Not all of them ran at the same rate. So using the sun to define a point in time makes a lot of sense. Um, and solar noon is defined as that point where the sun is highest in the sky. It's not gonna get any higher and it'll start to sink down towards the Western horizon. Now, unfortunately, this depends on where you're located on earth. Your position on earth will change the time of solar noon. So it's not the same as clock noon. You might think, well, that, you know, today you started at 12 noon. Well, it's not yet local solar noon at Griffith Observatory. We have a little ways to go before that's gonna be the, the time. And in fact, you can see our time zone, the Pacific time zone is pretty darn wide. So everybody is experiencing the same time throughout all of that, but the sun cannot be directly overhead for everybody. In Las Vegas, it's gonna be overhead at a different time than it is here in Los Angeles. And certainly that goes by uh, according to the other time zones as well. You can see here, uh, we have a lot of time zones covering the whole earth and it's split up this way, mostly for convenience. So people can have a similar time. You can, you can know what time it is in different places on the earth and uh, it's all based around these time zones. Well, today, what should we expect to see, Patrick? Well, at local noon, uh, which occurs at uh, 101 uh, Pacific Daylight Time, uh, this is where the sun will be positioned um, over uh, Los Angeles, um, looking directly south. And the sun is actually um, at the intersection of three different lines, uh, coordinate lines in the sky. Um, it is uh, lined up on the meridian, which is a line that runs vertically uh, from the horizon um, all the way up to the zenith of the sky and then uh, back down to the northern, uh, due north part of the sky. And also it's on the celestial equator, the Earth's equator projected into the sky. And it's also uh, right on um, a line called the ecliptic, which is the sun's path throughout the year. It's the apparent path as we move around the sun, uh, the sun appears to move around the sky. So it's in the, at the intersection of those three lines, which um, is when uh, the vernal equinox happens. But at local noon, uh, that's where the sun is. It's located uh, 56 degrees above due south today. 
Oh, interesting. Now, uh, this also defines, you mentioned coordinates, a coordinate system that astronomers use. Um, if the coordinate of the sun today, well, at 8.33 this morning, if I remember the time right, um, the sun was at zero, zero. So its coordinate was right at the origin of this coordinate system. So um, astronomers use this to define the positions of everything in the sky. So um, today is a special day to have the sun at that location. It does mean that the earth is being illuminated equally. Um, like you mentioned, our axis is pointed straight up and down with respect to where the sunlight is coming from. And uh, it, it should mean we have equal amounts of daylight and equal amounts of night, but our atmosphere actually bends the sunlight a little bit and gives us a little bit more sunshine. Now, if you'd like to observe all of this, don't go stare at the sun. That's a really bad idea. Don't go out and look at it directly. If you have some eclipse glasses like these folks do, you can safely look at the sun, of course. Um, I wouldn't expect to see too much. There's, there's quite a lot of sunspots these days um, as we're getting closer to the time when the sun's very active, but they're very hard to see with that. And your best bet is actually to observe local solar noon with us right here on the stream. Or if you happen to be at Griffith Observatory, you can peer down into the Gottlieb Transit Corridor to our Meridian Arc and see Dr. Krupp lead us there at local solar noon. But we are still a little ways away from that time right now. And we're very lucky to have Dr. Krupp here today to present to us inhabiting the meridian and tell us all about our meridian arc and how that all works. So um, Dr. Krupp, what, what is inhabiting the meridian and how are we going to do that today? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reitzel and of course, Mr. So, and thank you everyone for tuning in today to Griffith Observatory Television and observing with us the vernal equinox has been said. And in particular, also a short time from now, a local noon in Griffith Observatory, Scottlieb Transit Corridor on this first day of spring, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and as a prelude to local noon, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time with the Meridian, which is inextricably linked with local noon. Uh, today, as you've already heard, local noon occurs at 1.01 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and you'll be able to see that uh, occurring live at Griffith Observatory in the transit corridor. The exact moment of the vernal equinox, as you also heard today, occurred at 8.33 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, just about three and a half hours ago. Well, the, the meridian, of course, uh, the meridian is, is a fundamental uh, reference in our system of directions. And it is just the line that runs on the ground from true north uh, to true south or the other way around, if you like to think of it that way. And wherever you go, uh, there you are on some local meridian. Uh, this one, in fact, happens to be the, the meridian at Greenwich, to which we'll come back in a little bit. Many monumental antiquities were intentionally aligned with the meridian or as is also said, the same thing, the cardinal directions. And actually our, our maps are typically oriented by the meridian, very often with north at the top. The grid plans of major cities are built to it. That's the plan of Chicago and its streets are north, south uh, in orientation or perpendicular to it, east, west. Uh, and then of course, the uh, very design of Griffith Observatory adheres uh, to the cardinal directions and the meridian, the main axis of Griffith Observatory is the meridian, the north-south line. The meridian originates in the basic behavior of the sky and is a fundamental astronomical reference. It's probably most familiar to people as the prime meridian, uh, the meridian at Greenwich, England. And the Greenwich meridian serves as the adopted zero point uh, for uh, longitudes on the earth. Uh, it's a primary attraction at the old observatory, old Royal Observatory at, at Greenwich. People go there, visit it, they stand on it, they uh, sit on it, uh, and in fact, uh, they observe on it. So the meridian then is the north-south line, and we identify those directions, north and south, through the most fundamental motion of the sky, its daily rotation. Uh, thanks to the spin of the earth uh, on its axis, the entire sky seems to turn around a single unmoving spot in the sky. And that motion is revealed by this, uh, this time exposure photograph. Uh, the photograph is aimed at the north pole of the sky and the camera is, is left open for a bit. And those stars, as they move around it, as they seem to circuit it, leave trails, just a fraction of an entire 
uh, trail that would complete the circle. Uh, but they are all centered then on the North Celestial Pole, which is the North Pole of the sky. And Polaris, the North Star, is fortuitously, just by chance, close to that position. That's why you can use that star to find the direction north. The direction on the ground directly below the North Celestial Pole is north. And that, in fact, is how the direction north originates. In this diagram, again, we're looking north. We see the circles that represent trails of stars due to the moving Earth. And there's a dot in that line that's going up from the northern direction up and toward the top and across the sky. That black dot just represents the North Pole of the sky and the location where you would find the star Polaris now, if, if you could see it. So keep in mind then, that once again, this is, this is where we get North from. Uh, we, we really wouldn't be talking about North if the world uh, didn't turn, but as the world turns, the sky delivers these directions. And as the sky rotates around the North Celestial Pole, the objects in the sky, the sun, the moon, the planets and the stars, all cross or transit the meridian. Now, this is a kind of a geometric fiction uh, of looking at the sky, which puts the earth at the center uh, of everything, the sky kind of a hemisphere above it and, and the part that we don't see blocked by the earth below it. Uh, but there is a dotted line that extends out from the top of the earth as far as we like to think of it, the North Pole of the earth. And it goes to that dome of the sky, which is the North Celestial Pole. And those bright spots, those three bright spots are just the sun, the sun rising in fact uh, due east in this diagram at the vernal equinox crossing to its highest point in the sky for this location, and then setting over there uh, due west as the sunset comes. And so all of these things uh, at any transit, uh, any celestial object then is at the summit or the top of its path across the sky. And local noon is just when the sun is at the top of its daily path. Well, the word meridian is rooted in the words that mean midday or, or noon. And when the sun transits the meridian, then it is local noon. When the sun is east of the meridian, it is said to be anti-meridium or AM before midday. When the sun is west of the meridian, it is post-meridium or PM after midday. And that's where we get those abbreviations. Uh, just for the record, noon is neither AM nor PM. And, and the same is true for midnight. Uh, so you have a, a, a singular time at noon and a singular time at midnight that those both are neither a.m. nor p.m., but just noon and midnight. And so the meridian then, when taking all of these things into account, is, is a time uh, and a place and a direction. And the meridian is also identified with that celestial arc that vaults the sky from the north point on the horizon through the zenith, as you heard Patrick so describe earlier, overhead and to the south point on the horizon. And every month, uh, magazines uh, dedicated to astronomy, like Sky and Telescope, uh, publish an all-sky map equipped with a celestial meridian. And this one, it's just that blue vertical line that bisects the chart from north to south with the zenith, the point that is straight overhead at the center of the chart. Now, from the center of the Earth, the distinction between north and south, I'm sorry, from the surface of the earth, the distinction between north and south really is profound. Uh, the stars travel uh, in circles around the north celestial pole, as you saw recorded, at least uh, with partial trails in that earlier time, or time exposure photograph. And, and looking to the north, then the, the stars appear to follow uh, those longer, flatter trails. If uh, we, we, we look to the south, we see those longer, flatter trails. They're, they're, they're still circles, but they're very much larger circles than we uh, see when we look to the north. And, and as a result, they do look longer and flatter in the southern direction. Uh, the, uh, th th this effect of the sky, this geometry of the sky, is really evident to anyone who pays attention. And our ancestors were aware of these directional distinctions and our ongoing use of them is really just a perpetuation of very, very old habits. Evidence of these habits shows up in many ancient and prehistoric sites. Uh, for example, 
uh, right here in California, there's a, a natural rock shelter in Ventura County in the Los Padres National Forest. And it's enriched uh, with, with two mash pictographs, paintings that are on the, the ceiling or, or roof of, of that shelter. Uh, just by chance, uh, this shelter happens to open uh, to due north. Uh, and, and so if you're seated inside of it, your window in fact includes the North Star, the brightest star in that field of view. Uh, and of course, again, a time exposure photograph will reveal the trails of, of stars turning around it. Even more interesting, a natural crack in the ceiling of that shelter happens once again, just by chance to be on axis. It, it points toward the North Pole of the sky because the angle by chance is just right. And these spirit creatures painted on it appear to be following it out of the shelter and on an upward slant toward the North Pole of the sky, a, a destination of supernatural shamanic power in the Chumash tradition, the Chumash uh, being the, the group of Indians that, that painted these pictographs in the first place. Well, this same principle is deliberately expressed in monumental architecture in Chaco Canyon in Northwest New Mexico. Pueblo Benito, a large multi-story uh, apartment complex is oriented with the meridian and commemorates its orientation in a north-south line. You can see that line in the plan just bisecting the, the two halves of, of this sort of semi-circular uh, structure, uh, but getting up above it and, and looking uh, to the south, you can also see uh, that wall very deliberately splitting the, the site into two principal zones in the building's plaza. Uh, there's a, another feature called the Great North Road that just continues on out to the north and departed from Chaco Canyon's north rim and past shrines and landmarks on a straight line all the way to the north, just perpetuating that concept of the meridian through the landscape. Now in Beijing, in the People's Republic of China, we have the only world capital that still adheres to a sacred cosmological plan. During the, the Ming Dynasty, it was all laid out on a meridian, a north-south line that has been preserved still by the, the current government. And it's apparent in the ritual walkway uh, that uh, runs through the entire imperial palace. This line was focused on the emperor who held court at the Hall of Supreme Harmony, uh, seen at the end of the line in, in this particular view. The line then focused on him there. He was the sky's agent on earth and the terrestrial, the earthbound counterpart uh, to the North Celestial Pole, that stable singular spot in the sky around which all the stars seem to be turning. Just as all the stars circumambulated around the North Celestial Pole, the visible face of the high god Shangdi uh, uh, was at the uh, uh, center of, of all of the cosmos and all of the court uh, circulated around the emperor, the center of the cosmos as it is here on earth. Well, Egypt's great pyramid at Giza and the rest of Egypt's pyramids are all cardinally oriented too. By incorporating cosmic order in a monumental architecture, the Egyptians miniaturized the cosmos into a terrestrial setting and thereby transformed it into sacred space. It is this notion of bringing order, cosmic order into a space that in fact gives it that character of being sacred to traditional cultures. Uh, you can see that the orientation of these pyramids is cardinal, uh, oriented with the meridian line at Giza, uh, just by the, the faces of the pyramid all running uh, to the directions north, south, and east and west. The observatory of Guoshou Jing, uh, a 13th century Chinese astronomer at uh, a town called Gaocheng in North Central China operates actually like a sundial uh, and it was used to establish and refine the calendar with shadows that were cast on a, a, a long low meridian wall. In the diagram, uh, we, we see how the sun very high at summer solstice or much lower at winter solstice cast shadows of two different lengths along that wall that extends to the left of the, of the diagram. And that wall it really is just a, a low wall that continues through the courtyard and is a, a, a physical uh, expression of the meridian used to make these observations. These principles were applied 
uh, even more deliberately in the 14th century by the Islamic astronomer and ruler Ulugh Beg at Samarkand in what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia. He put an arc uh, on his meridian uh, and the cross section of that circular building uh, shows the arc uh, reaching from several stories up and, and then into a subterranean space below. But that large arc enabled him to make a series of observations. Parts of that arc, the subterranean part, uh, survives even today. And so you can see the parts of it for uh, locating very high objects in the sky as they're, they're sending uh, their, their light or being sighted uh, from those positions in order to make whatever kinds of astronomical observations uh, were intended, whether it's timekeeping, uh, the calendar, or mapping the stars. Europe developed its own calendrical revelations in this kind of architecture with giant meridian scales that were installed in churches. At first, they were intended to monitor the progress of the year calendrically, but, but these meridianas were eventually inscribed on church floors by astronomers for making precise measurements of the sun's daily noon elevation. In this diagram, the meridiana is the long line that extends from the left uh, to the right along the ground. And at the very left of the diagram, there's a high wall with a kind of a circle in it. Uh, and that circle is the aperture that permits sunlight to fall through the circle and hit that north-south line at local noon. The angle at which it strikes varies, of course, through the uh, year because the angle of the sun changes through the year. And so we find that pinhole image of the sun crossing the meridian each day at local noon and the point where it intercepts the line just depends on that elevation. And because that angle depends on the date, the meridiana operates as a calendar. And this ele elevation does illustrate a meridiana that was designed by Ignacio Dante in San Petronio in Italy, uh, a 14th century Gothic basilica, actually in Bologna and built in 1575. Uh, Dante's San Petronio meridiana was actually never completed and it was replaced in 1655 by a, a grander meridiana designed by the astronomer Gian Domenico Cassini. Uh, Cassini's uh, 220 foot long meridian is still embedded in the cathedral stone floor. And here's the sunlight crossing that line. You can see the line uh, marked uh, in, in the white pavement and the circle, really an elongated circle, an ellipse, is just beginning to cross over that line uh, at local noon on the 18th of November, in this case in 2004. There are quite a few of these meridianas to be found, uh, particularly in churches in, in uh, Europe, but uh, this is the meridiana in the old upper part of Bergamo, in, also in Italy, in Northern Italy, uh, and it's in a kind of a public uh, uh, plaza. Uh, and it's operating just like clockwork again with the spot of light crossing that line on the 14th of October, 2009. Of course, formal observations of, of the sun's meridian transits like this persisted in national observatories like the, the Paris Observatory, uh, the cornerstone of which was laid on the summer solstice, first day of summer in 1667 during the reign of, of Louis XIV and France adopted the axis of the Paris Observatory as its preferred primary meridian. Now, Jean-Dominique Cassini was invited to Paris to assist development of the new Paris Observatory, and he became the first director. And he extended the inquiry he had undertaken at San Petronio, and he constructed a large meridiana in the Great Hall on the second floor of the Paris Observatory, and you're looking um, south at it uh, in, in the room there. It's 96 feet, 10 inches long, and he wanted the building to perform as an instrument, and so he designed his meridiana to coincide with the meridian of France, which just continues outside, marked on the pavement and, and through the gardens and ultimately across the countryside. So with it, Cassini planned to obtain more precise determination of the apparent annual motion of the sun. Well, despite the French preference for the French prime meridian, uh, the local Greenwich meridian occupied by George Airy's transit circle 
uh, an instrument intended to observe celestial objects on the meridian or when they're transiting. This, this meridian was officially adopted as the prime meridian of the world in October, 1884 at the International Meridian Conference that was held in Washington, DC. Airy was England's astronomer royale and his transit circle at the Greenwich Observatory was used in the service of British map making. The old Royal Observatory had been established in 1675 by King Charles II, who wanted it dedicated, quote, to finding out the longitude of places for perfecting navigation and astronomy. Well, of course, uh, the, the British weren't the only ones doing that long before England and France drew a line in the land for zero degrees longitude. Astronomy in medieval India staked a prime meridian claim through Ujjain, a city that's about 400 miles south of the capital, New Delhi. Ujjain is in central India, uh, and it was believed to occupy the latitude of the Tropic of Cancer, the place uh, where the sun is directly overhead at local noon on the summer solstice. And so that in part accounts for the status and the instruments that were built there are still in place today, including uh, this one, which was used to observe the sun on the meridian. The, this instrument was built by Sawajai Singh II, the Rajput ruler of Jaipur. He built the instruments at Ujjain in 1730, and he built four more monumental observatories and his most elaborate observatory is in Jaipur. There, the great Samrat Yantra makes sculpture and architecture out of uh, an astronomical instrument. It includes a particularly interesting component, the, the Sashantra Yantra, a cardinally oriented room that houses a pair of inscribed quadrants. Now that's the entry door to that room. And when you go inside, uh, you find uh, a pair of these quadrants. Just one is shown here, but it's a quarter circle arc that has lines very precisely marked upon it. And this room permits light from the transiting sun at local noon to enter the darkened chamber. You see one of those holes in the south wall and light is already entering and hitting not the arc yet, but the side wall and producing that spot of light. And as the sun continues to move across the sky, it, it light falls into uh, two holes that are up there and each of them transmit an image, a pinhole image of the sun onto the quadrants that are down below. And inscribed like rulers, those quadrants then enable the astronomer to measure the angle exactly, get a direct observation of the position of the sun, which is then linked to the calendar and the progress of the year. Well, there are, there are really all kinds of meridians around the world, but anyone who collects meridian markers now must navigate a course uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, everybody knows about the Greenwich Meridian, of course, but this, this is the Griffith Meridian. Now, keep in mind that Griffith Observatory is cardinally oriented uh, and it faces due north uh, and its telescopes are aligned with the North Celestial Pole to facilitate continuous tracking of celestial objects. And, and that's the observatory's 12 inch Zeiss refractor telescope. And it is in fact pointed not only at Comet Yakutake uh, in that view, but also at the North Pole of the sky. Now, although Griffith Observatory was conceived and, and constructed to conform to the needs of modern public astronomy, its Greek revival Beaux-Arts modern architecture reflects the, the traditional vision of cosmic order. Uh, telescopes operate on this principle. The telescope is rotated around its polar axis at a rate that compensates for the turning Earth. That's why the telescope can track an object. That motorized drive is following and compensating uh, the motion of the Earth and so following the, the sky. The sundial at Griffith Observatory is also aligned with the meridian and that permits its shadows to convey the time systematically and accurately. And the mirrors of Griffith Observatory's triple beam celestat or solar telescope are also on the meridian. It's just another telescope tracking another astronomical object across the sky. Well, the Griffith Meridian 
is actually part of a singular and monumental public instrument, the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. There's really nothing like it uh, anywhere else in the world. And this instrument is integrated into uh, the actual architecture of the observatory on the west side where parallel glass walls, 150 feet long and, and 20 feet high, preserve below grade, the grade of the lawn, the observatory's signature vista of the western horizon. And this instrument demonstrates daily how the sky works through meridian transits of the sun, and for that matter, the moon and the stars over the walled corridor. The corridor, 10 feet wide, is bisected by the bronze meridian line, which is set into the concrete floor, and extends the full length of the walls, which frame the celestial meridian and then turn an astronomical abstraction, the idea of a line that crosses over the sky, an arc, into a real visual experience. So when you look up in the transit corridor, you're actually seeing a ribbon of sky that corresponds to the celestial meridian. The architecture then reveals astronomy. At the north end, the meridian line on the ground climbs a stairway constructed to ascend at the angle of the north celestial pole. If you enter the Gottlieb transit corridor at night like this and, and then just go to the bottom of the stairs and look up the banister, uh, you will be sighting the North Star right along that banister. The fundamental character of, of Griffith Observatory is, of course, indicated right on the front of the building where bronze letters declare Griffith Observatory. It is an observatory and it does put visitors eyeball to the universe. Griffith Observatory is a public observatory and the building is filled with instruments. All of them deliver real data and real experiences and transform visitors into observers of nature and the sky through the instruments. And so we are mobilized by the concept of the building as instrument, the architecture and the contents of the building, all are instrument oriented to turn visitors into observers. Well, the Gottlieb Transit Corridor is just another dimension of the immersive encounter with the sky at Griffith Observatory. And there's more to it than the long glass corridor, the North Stairway and the Bronze Meridian Line. At the south end, there's a tall and night black monolith that supports a stainless steel foil at the top end. And on the ground just north of the monolith stands a massive and inscribed bronze and stainless uh, steel meridian arc, uh, also now visible in that view. And above that arc on the inside face of the glass wall on the west to the left in this view is mounted a huge and heavy ecliptic chart. That is a chart of the stars uh, that are on either side of the ecliptic, the sun's path uh, through the entire sky. Well, the foil attached to the monolith that stainless steel metal piece that's bent and connected to the top of the, the black monolith uh, is equipped with a complicated and technically advanced device, a hole. You can see the hole there. And an object, say the sun, as it transits the, the corridor, its light passes through the hole. And where that light falls depends on the angle that the object makes with the horizon and an object again reaches its highest elevation when it transits. Well, the monolith and the foil permit light from the transiting sun to strike the meridian arc. And when it does that uh, arc, uh, hits that arc, it also comes close to a number of lines that mark important information on, on that arc. Uh, that sun's image is actually about three inches in diameter. And as it crosses the arc, it crosses those markers and lines. And so in doing, it announces the date on one of those scales that is inscribed with the months and the days and the corresponding ecliptic constellation figures. And special emblems also spotlight the solstices and the equinoxes, and for that matter, uh, the major standstill of, of the moon. Well, people walk outside uh, and inside the transit corridor, and they watch all of this, and they also watch it then from the terrace above. Actually, Tycho Brahe uh, did something like this. In 1582, that celebrated astronomer fabricated, fabricated and installed uh, a large bronze engraved meridian arc for transit observations in Uraniborg, the, the castle observatory that he built 
on the island of Ben, just off of Denmark. We have, however, uh, linked the Meridian Arc, where the sun makes its daily noon transit, with the big star chart on the wall. Uh, and when the, the sun approaches the center line on the Meridian Arc and gets closer and closer to the center, it activates sensors that are in that arc, that, that line of, of little dots right in the middle. And the sunlight is just about to reach them there. And once it actually does reach those dots as it passes across the arc, it activates lights in the ecliptic chart that indicate where the sun is among the background stars at that time. And it lights up those background stars that the sun occupies as well. Those stars, of course, are invisible during the daytime, but this signal transmitted to the ecliptic chart prompts the illumination of lights that indicate the current position of the ecliptic and let visitors see what stars are really up there even though they're invisible. So the meridian is a place and a time and a direction. And when visitors arrive at this junction of earth and sky, they occupy a, a place where space begins, a kind of a cosmic modem that downloads the sky. They connect what happens in the sky with place and time and direction here on earth in a dramatic, precise, and, and content-rich revelation in light. Meridian, then, is, is, is not just an instrument or, or a concept. It is a stage, and the universe plays and performs on it daily, and I'm about to go out and join the universe out in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor in a moment, and I'll meet you there. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Kraut. Uh, very insightful about um, the instrument, what we're seeing, how it's going to work. Now, Best of all, of course, we are going to get to see the Meridian Arc in action. Dr. Krupp is on his way down to the Gottlieb Transit Corridor right now, and uh, we'll just wait for him to get there. Our staff will let us know when he's down there. So while we wait for him to go down there, let me talk to you about a couple of more things. Um, first of all, I'll show you once again our beautiful Gottlieb Transit Corridor and the Meridian Arc. This is what it looks like. Um, so if you're at Griffith Observatory, Anytime you can come at local noon and see this in action yourself. And currently we are open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we are open right now and folks can watch the Meridian Arc in action. Now, again, today we are celebrating the first day of spring for the Northern Hemisphere and the first day of fall for the Southern Hemisphere. It is known as the vernal equinox, technically. And what's happening is the Earth's axis maintains the same direction in space year to year. It does have a wobble to it, but it takes tens of thousands of years to, to make a full wobble. So from one year to the next, our axis is pointed at the same position up into the sky, like Dr. Krupp told you about. It's pointed at Polaris currently. And as it orbits the sun, that direction stays the same. That angle's the same. So right now, you can see we are at spring on March 20th, as you can see in the background. In the southern hemisphere, it is autumn, but the sun is hitting the earth, exactly illuminating the, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere evenly. They're getting even illumination. And the sun, or the earth rather, travels in this diagram um, from spring towards the Northern Hemisphere summer that'll occur in June, around June 20th and 21st. I'm not sure the actual date on that. I need to look it up. Patrick, do you know when the first day of summer is for us? The 20th. I, I think it is the 20th. And, and of course it changes due to leap year. We have this quarter of a day roughly per year that we have to make up for. So it drifts a little bit in time. Um, so on the first day of summer, as you can see, that axis is pointed towards the sun. So you get more sunlight in the Northern hemisphere, less sunlight in the Southern hemisphere. So in the Southern hemisphere, it'll be the first day of winter. Continuing along another quarter of the year, we get to the first day of autumn, which is kind of like a repeat of today where the earth is getting evenly illuminated in the North and the South, except the North is headed towards autumn and the South, it's the first day of spring. And you continue on over on the first day of winter, the axis, the northern pole, is tilted as far away from the sun as it can get. Up in the north, north pole, you get 24 hours of darkness. In the south pole, you'll have 24 hours of sunlight. Um, Antarctica loves that, of course. They don't get any darkness, and they can do lots of solar research and have plenty of daylight. And then the whole thing just repeats. We do have a slide here that, that shows you this 
um, in a little bit more detail, as you can see, actual, actual pictures of the Earth with it being evenly illuminated and tilted in each of the directions. Of course, you can see the first day of summer for the North, again, fall, and the first day of winter for the Northern Hemisphere. And those are real satellite pictures. Now, some folks are, get confused about what causes the seasons. They don't think it's the tilt of the Earth. They think it's because we're closer to the sun. Well, it turns out we are closer to the sun on January 3rd. So that's when we're closer and we're closer by a fair amount. It's millions of kilometers, uh, millions of miles that we're closer. So the Northern hemisphere winter is probably slightly milder than it, than it would be otherwise. The earth actually moves faster in its orbit when it's closer to the sun. So we are traveling quicker through space at that position of time as well. And we will uh, swing around towards March out on the apoapsis as it's labeled there. Um, you can see that uh, it's aphelion as well. On, on July 3rd, we are traveling more slowly in our orbit. And that's actually when we're in summertime. So the sun appears to travel more slowly along the ecliptic in July than it does in January. So these are some subtle changes, but it doesn't greatly affect our seasons. Our seasons are, are controlled mostly by that tilt, which is why in July we are, uh, we are tilted you know, towards the sun in the Northern hemisphere. And that's, even though we're further from the sun, we are warmer and we continue to warm up. Um, one more thing to keep in mind also, some might say, well, if the first day of summer is June 20th, why isn't that the hottest day? Well, it turns out that the earth is still receiving more energy from the sun than it loses out into space still for a couple of more months. So the temperatures will continue to warm up. It's a little bit like turning up your burner and you bring the water to a boil, if you, if you turn it down just a little bit, you're still adding more energy to it. That pot's going to continue to boil away. However, if you turn it down far enough, the boiling will, will subside, come to a halt. And it all depends on how much energy you're putting into the system versus how much can leave it. So um, throughout all of summer, we're getting more energy from the sun than we're losing out into space up in the Northern hemisphere. So well, it just during summer, it works completely. In the Southern Hemisphere, that summertime is in our winter. So um, th that's the reason we have seasons. And then finally, of course, uh, we mentioned this earlier, that direction that's, that's labeled there by that funny symbol, that's the vernal equinox. And today, the sun is actually at that position where RA and the declination and the right ascension, as it's called, are at the point of zero, zero. So the sun um, happens to be there. Oh, let me get my laser pointer here and I can point it out to you. I've been motioning on the wrong part, but you can see the sun, it travels along. Well, as earth goes around, the sun appears to move in our sky. Today, it is located right here. And that coordinate is zero, zero. So it's kind of a special day today to have that there. Now I'm sure Dr. Krepp is getting down there and is getting close to being ready to talk to us about the actual meridian arc. So as soon as he's down there, Steph, you certainly can uh, switch over to him and I'll, I'll, I'll know that that's happening. But folks, I want to remind you tonight, we actually have another presentation you can join us at or join us on um, at 6.30 tonight, bringing you the sunset. We will observe the sunset at Griffith Observatory. Now, this is actually, this is actually the first day of summer sunset and the sun will set right along one of our sunset lines. So you can join us tonight for that. But right now, Dr. Krupp is ready down at the Gottlieb Transit Corridor at our Meridian Arc. So take it away, Dr. Krupp. Ed Krupp, director of Griffith Observatory here with the broadcast crew for our live performance of the Vernal Equinox and Local Noon at Griffith Observatory. And I'm in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor at Griffith Observatory. The Gottlieb Transit Corridor has three words in its name, Gottlieb, Transit, and Corridor. Well, the corridor part is pretty easy. This is a corridor that runs along a north-south direction established by glass walls on either side of me. One of those walls forms the, the, the barrier, the wall for the cafe at the end of the universe, and the other wall is just the wall that we need for the Gottlieb Transit Corridor to be a corridor. 
Gottlieb, of course, is the name of Robert and Suzanne Gottlieb, and they made a generous donation to Griffith Observatory's renovation and expansion that was completed in 2006. The middle word, transit, is a little trickier because in astronomy, transit can mean several things. But here in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor, it refers to the passage of a celestial object when it crosses the meridian, the north-south line. Well, the north-south line or meridian, of course, is evident in the transit corridor. It runs all the way along the ground from the black monolith that is to, uh, in front of me here, all the way to the north end and the stairway that continues on up to the upper levels there. And objects transit the meridian, uh, the, when they transit the meridian, they are reaching their highest point of their daily arc across the sky. And when the sun does that, as mentioned earlier, that is called noon, local noon, and it is in fact the time when we would see the sun not only transit at its highest point, but also cast its shortest shadow for that day. The length, the length of those shadows, though, changes over the course of the year, and that's what allows us to use the Gottlieb Transit Corridor not only to mark local noon on any given day, but also to see how the sky works and how these things change over the course of the year and the seasons that accompany the moving of the sun as it changes its apparent position in the sky around us. Again, it's not, of course, the sun that's moving. We're turning around it. We're moving on our orbit around the sun and we're spinning in space. And the point around which we spin in space, the North Celestial Pole, is directly to the north of us and in the sky. And if you should visit Griffith Observatory and come here at night and sight on the banister at the far north end of the corridor, that will, in fact, point straight up to the north pole of the sky, marked by the star Polaris, very nearly on that spot. And around that point, the whole sky seems to turn because the Earth is turning uh, on its axis in space. Well, the turning of that Earth is what, in fact, brings these objects uh, across the sky for us, rising in the east and setting in the west, and, of course, being in the due south direction when they're in their transit position. These directions, north and south and east and west, as we speak of them, are the cardinal directions. Those are the true directions. You often encounter them on maps, as we've seen, and, of course, incorporated into a whole variety of, of different monuments from ancient times, where people organized the universe, or their picture of the universe, around fundamental directions that were evident by the behavior of the sky. Now here at Griffith Observatory, we are at local noon waiting for the sun, in fact, to cross the meridian. And it will, when it crosses the meridian, it will intersect the meridian arc. And if you look carefully at the meridian arc, you can see that it is inscribed. There is, in fact, uh, a line that marks uh, the position of a constellation. In this case, the constellation is Aries, and there's a figure of the constellation Aries right here. And as we keep moving along the, the meridian arc, we find as well uh, other constellations, Taurus, the Bull, Gemini, the Twins, and so on. All the constellations of the Zodiac, those are the constellations through which the Sun appears to move over the course of the year as the Earth travels in its, its orbit. In addition, on the meridian arc, Arc, there are a number of little lines that are accompanied by the names of the months. Uh, May, for example, right near me here, April, and of course March uh, just a little bit above that. And those then are the dates according to uh, the, our calendar. And so today is the vernal equinox and it happens to fall this year on the 20th of March. And we have a marker on the meridian arc for the vernal equinox point itself. So that little marker right there is the target for the sun as it's approaching uh, the meridian arc uh, for local noon. The sun is actually visible right now. If you think about how this instrument works, we've got the monolith uh, in front of me supporting the large foil with the technically complex hole in the top of it that is allowing sunlight to pass through and onto the ground and we have the shadow of that foil and the dot of the sun, the pinhole projection image of the sun on the ground right now. And 
as we are waiting, the earth is just turning and it, it's apparent that it's turning because this is moving closer and closer and closer to the meridian arc. Well, over the course of the year, the point at which that spot of sunlight strikes the arc, of course, depends on how high the sun is crossing. Well, everybody knows that in summertime, the sun is very high. You're all laid out on the beach and, and the sun is practically overhead. And so when the sun passes through that hole, it is actually striking on the summer solstice almost straight down here. In fact, right at this point for the summer solstice. In wintertime, everyone knows as well that the sun doesn't follow a, a high arc rising out of the northeast crossing high on the south and then setting in the northwest, but instead rises in the southeast, follows a low arc across the sky and sets in the southwest. That means the spot of light is approaching the meridian arc at a very low angle and the winter solstice point is way up at the top there and that's where that dot uh, happens to uh, occur when you're at winter solstice. So over the course of the entire year, we see the sun moving each day along the meridian arc up to December and then back down to June again. There's one more element, of course, of this, and that is the series of sensors that we encounter running the entire length of the meridian arc. Those dots that are going up from the uh, winter solstice point down to the summer solstice point. This is where we depart from ancient astronomy. You would congratulate Griffith Observatory for a moment thinking about this business with the sun rising at the solstices and crossing over the sky and say, congratulations Griffith Observatory, you have successfully designed a Stone Age instrument. But we say, no, no, wait, there's more to that than there. We, we've got a Stone Age instrument with some Renaissance ornamentation on some fine metalwork. It's more advanced than that. but. That's still not good enough. This is actually, as you all know, the 21st century. And 21st century technology means that we need to show everybody the invisible stars. Well, the invisible stars are all depicted on the ecliptic chart that is above and behind me. That undulating line that goes through those stars is the path of the sun. It follows that path over the course of the entire year and it is the sun is on that path among those stars at some point on each day. The sun in this case though is occupying stars that can't be seen and that's easy to understand. It's up there with the stars. It's daytime. The sun's too bright. You can't see those stars. But here, as the sun approaches Griffith Observatory's transit corridor meridian arc, that light of the sun reaches these sensors. And when that light reaches the sensors, it activates the ecliptic chart. And if everything works correctly, technology of the 21st century will light up the position of the sun among the background stars and in fact, the stars in the constellation that the sun is occupying at this time. Well, the sun is moving a little bit closer, that is the pinhole projection is moving a little bit closer to the meridian arc, and we are beginning to get the shadow of the monolith crossing the meridian arc. As that time approaches closer to local noon, it's well to keep in mind that this is really contradicting everything we kind of think about when it comes to time. I am telling you that local noon is going to occur and it will occur at 1.01 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So how come that's not taking place when uh, the big hand is on the 12 and the little hand is on the 12? Well, there are several factors that alter the difference between local solar time and clock time that we keep uh, on our watches and other timekeeping devices. Now, the first thing to keep in mind about these two differences, and the easy one, is that right now we're on daylight time. That's one hour difference from our normal time zone time. So that shifts everything off away from 12 noon or a time closer to it. But even if we were on standard time, this spot of sunlight wouldn't cross the meridian arc at exactly 12 on the clock face because there are other differences that are also important to the location of your observer on the ground. Here 
in Los Angeles, we're in the Pacific time zone. The Pacific time zone is a span of considerable geography, and there are a bunch of other time zones, 24 of them around the entire world. Well, there is a difference in time between the time at the center of the time zone and where you might be off of that, uh, Los Angeles being uh, several minutes, in fact, off of the meridian of its time zone. So that introduces another displacement in time. But there's yet one more, and that one additional factor has to do with the Earth moving around the Sun in its orbit. We like to think of that orbit as practically a circle, and it really is practically a circle, but it's not exactly a circle. That orbit of the Earth is slightly squashed. It is an ellipse, and that means there is time when the Sun moves a little bit faster on the ecliptic, and a little bit slower because the Earth is moving a little bit slower in its orbit when it's closer to the Sun and a little bit far faster when it's uh, farther from or a little bit farther faster when it's closer to the Sun and slower uh, when it's farther. I think I've mixed that whole thing up didn't I? Let's try it again. The Sun the Earth is moving faster when it's closest to the Sun and slower when it's farther from the Sun. And we are closest to the Sun actually in January, in the middle of our winter. And so the difference between seasons has nothing to do really uh, with the distance between uh, the Earth and the Sun. It's a very small difference. And in fact, it has everything to do with the slant of the Earth's axis in space. And so on the equinox, that axis in space is turning out to be practically vertical, perpendicular to the direction of the sun, and it is much more oblique at the two solstices. We get full illumination or much more illumination in the northern hemisphere, in northern hemisphere summer, and far less in summer. Well, the spot of sunlight is continuing to approach closer to the meridian arc, and it will in, uh, intercept uh, the arc in, in just a moment. We've got these differences in time, and we've got the differences in direction, but there's one other question that you might want to ask about the meridian arc. I explained, of course, that we go from summer solstice up to winter solstice and back down to summer solstice on the arc. And that means that we're using the same sensors to go up one half of the arc and back down the other half of the arc. One half of the year and the other half of the year. How is it that this instrument is able to accommodate both halves of the year with one set of sensors? The answer is actually right behind the arc and it's in this box here. This is the switch. We throw the switch at the solstice and that reverses the, uh, the access to the, um, the ecliptic chart and which part of the chart is affected by the sun's light. Well, the image of the sun is now beginning to encroach upon the meridian arc. The 20th of March is right here. The equinox point is right here. And as this small spot of sunlight moves to the east, as the sun is moving to the west, you can actually see that the Earth is turning by the movement of the Sun across the arc. And it's fairly quick. The Sun is continuing just to, conti uh, to move closer and closer to the sensors. A moment of high drama, of course, because if, in fact, none of this works, you'll regard Griffith Observatory as an utter astronomical <laughs> failure. But, in fact, it works every day on the money uh, and we've got a gorgeous day in Los Angeles today. A little windy, but a lot of sunlight uh, enabling us to be sure that uh, the, uh, the meridian arc should operate properly. This evening, the equinox will be commemorated again uh, up on the lower west terrace where there are lines inscribed to point to the setting sun at the summer solstice, the winter solstice, and the equinoxes. And Dr. David Reitzel will be out there on the Lower West Terrace uh, to uh, help the sun set on the equinox line uh, this evening. Well, we're getting closer to the equinox uh, point on the meridian arc. Uh, moment of high drama, of course.
It is local noon, the vernal equinox in Los Angeles at Griffith Observatory. The sensors on the meridian arc have activated the constellation and the position of the sun on the ecliptic chart above us. The, the sun is in the constellation of Pisces the fishes. So if you could see the stars out in the direction of the sun right now, those stars of Pisces would be out there. But because, of course, it's daytime, they're completely invisible. But here at Griffith Observatory, those stars are brought to you along with the equinox and local noon absolutely free by the City of Los Angeles, Department of Recreation and Parks, and Griffith Observatory, and the Griffith Observatory Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us for Local Noon, and if you stick with it, in a minute or so more, we'll cross the Meridian Arc, and everything will turn off again. Well, that was just a fantastic viewing of Local Solar Noon in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor at Griffith Observatory with our very own director. Now, folks, you can see this in person, of course, if you come on up to Griffith Observatory on any day that we're open, you can get into the transit corridor and you can observe local solar noon with our own building's instruments. This is, a, like, like was said, our observatory is built like an instrument. We have our entire corridor designed to observe local solar noon. It will light up on our, on our, on our chart, the position of the sun along the ecliptic. It lights up the stars that are behind the sun that you can't see during the day due to the bright atmosphere. They are there, believe it or not. And uh, it, as you can see right there, the position of the sun is at that zero, zero coordinate position, dead center of our chart which is quite exciting. And it's in the constellation of Pisces, the fishes. And if you wait just a couple of, of seconds here, it looks like the, the spot of sunlight is going to move off of the meridian arc. And those lights will turn off in just a few seconds here, it looks like to me. And yep, there they're gone. So local noon is officially over at Griffith Observatory. And uh, our presentation is winding down as well. You can join us tonight for our sunset presentation at 6.30 p.m., where I will be up at the sunset lines on the lower west terrace, and we'll see whether we put that line in the right position and whether the sun sets in the right direction that we've indicated. If all goes according to plan, the sun should set due west today, and uh, we'll have to take a look at that and see if that's the case. Patrick, what did you think about today's local solar noon? Oh, I think Patrick's muted. You couldn't ask for a better day. It, it was it was nice and clear, and we saw the the sun transit exactly as as we predicted uh, at one o one p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and um, we look forward to um, to more of these events. Uh, oh, just one correction is that. Uh, the, the summer solstice is June 21st this year. So it was last year, June 20th. So it, it's either 20th or 21st. Ah, well, thank you for looking that up. And in, in fact, that does, it drips a little bit because of that uh, leap year that we have that corrects it. So, um, or the lack of a leap year until we get one, it'll jump to the other side of it. So, um, but tonight you can come on up and join us. The sun is supposed to set just a, a, a little bit after 7 p.m. at like 7.05 p.m. is the time of sunset as we have it listed. Our presentation tonight will start at 6.30 p.m. where we'll talk a little bit about what today is. We'll remind you about what the equinox is. And then I will be down at the sunset line to take a look at the sun and we'll, we'll watch sunset together. It's a beautiful place to see the sunset. In fact, I think Griffith Observatory is the best location on earth to see a sunset with our location, looking out above Los Angeles, we have a view to the west, to the south, to the east. Um, we're essentially Los Angeles, Los Angeles's hood ornament up here on, on our mountain. And uh, we're gonna bring you sunset from that location and check to see whether we have that direction correct and whether the sun will set due to the west like we expect it to. But thank you very much for joining us today for our presentation about local solar noon from Griffith Observatory and observing local noon from the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. 
Again, this presentation is brought to you by the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks, Griffith Observatory. And as always, we like to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation for all they do to make this possible. And we thank everybody that has made donations throughout the time to help us keep these presentations rolling and get us the best equipment we possibly can have to show you what's up. As an added treat tonight, we will also be doing a little observing from one of our telescopes and we'll be live streaming that right after the sunset. As soon as it gets dark enough to see some things in the sky, we're gonna show off what our telescopes can pick up. Now, of course, the sky has to be clear and we have to have no clouds in order to be able to do that, but we will be streaming either way and we'll let you know what's going on. So thank you all for joining us. We very much appreciate you being here for Local Solar Noon. And again, uh, the Department of Recreation and Parks operates and owns and operates Griffith Observatory on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. And we are always happy to be here for you all. Thank you for joining us.